narrative, a brand new narrative for what is Cypriot. Uh, yeah. yeah, thanks, Nick. Thank you. Yeah. I'm just wondering what, on your expert opinion, do you think the constitutional or the institutional um, makeup would be to provide a well settled settlement? Would it look like the con uh, sensation, so, sensationalist system in Northern Ireland, whereby the first minister? comes from the majority party, the Protestants, and the deputy first minister must come from Sinn Féin, or the Catholic party. Yes. Okay, three um, <coughs> very easy questions, <laughs> short answers, so we can get a few more easy questions. Okay, Joanne, yes, the press, uh, some of the media. Uh, who is really favouring settlement in Cyprus? And that's, that's a key question. I think, uh, I mean, my, my professor uh, on, on, uh, on transformation in societies and the dynamics required for change uh, in um, ethnic conflict situations, in deep-rooted identity-related conflicts, was uh, Professor William Zantman, um, uh, who is um, um, sort of well-known for his theory of mutually hurting stalemates, which can help transform conflicts. If there is a mutually hurting stalemate, it could induce both sides to go in the direction of change. But if there is no mutually hurting stalemate, the, the tendency would be for the less hurt party to try to sustain the state of affairs, uh, hoping that the other side will give in at a certain time. So I think um, probably the reason we have had um, so difficulty in solving the Cyprus problem is that um, until 1974 we have had um, one comfortable zone for the big Cypriots, a less comfortable zone for Turkish Cypriots, but since 1974 maybe the comfort zones have increased for both communities. Um, so I think that, that could be one of the reasons that there are comfort zones for both communities today, and maybe there are people benefiting from uh, the conflict itself as such that we are having for the continuation of the conflict. Uh, I think there are less and less people looking ahead and understanding that this is not sustainable, but um, the fact that we don't have uh, any problems on the island today does not mean that we are not going to have them tomorrow. We may have problems because, uh, as we have seen, the problems that we see in Iraq and Syria are can jump to countries, and uh, we have seen it happening in, in, in different parts. I mean, you never know. I mean, we never expect something to the magnitude that, that we saw in, in Paris, for example. And you can, terror can expand, and it looks for places, convenient places to go. Can Cyprus, can, can it, it can provide such an opportunity because it's not very far. And we need to have people uh, traveling from Syria to the shores of Cyprus. You never know who those people are. They get in, at night, and it's difficult to detect them, that we have found cases where in the north we have found 40 people from Syria, all of a sudden in their village. So um, we have to we have to have, I mean this does not mean that with settlement we will have better control of situations, but it means that we can address them together. So uh, the answer to your question is, that I think we have the absence of foresight in Cyprus who, who understand the needs of shaping up the future have to be done today rather than tomorrow. And this is essential for both the exploitation of hydrocarbons, it is essential for security in the region, it is essential for two civilized communities on the island of Cyprus to live together with respecting each other. I don't know whether that answers your question, but I cannot say. I, I know that the least recent research that has been done in Cyprus 
says that younger communities, young, younger generations are distancing themselves from one another more than the older generation. Uh, responsibility of the leaders uh, for uh, dealing with the narratives in a sense. Yes, I agree. Education, I think, is a key tool that has to be used by both sides that we do not preach enmity, that we preach a piece of culture, a, cult a culture of peace, sorry, uh, on, on both sides of coexistence, I think has to be in place, which I think we have not been able to achieve to date. Uh, so there is a tremendous responsibility uh, on, the two, on the two leaders, uh, not only on education, but also in their statements. If you, uh, if, if the two leaders day in, day out say, for example, that, uh, again, uh, I may be biased in what I'm saying, but I'm trying to give an example in this case. If, if, if uh, one leader says that this is, the, uh, this is my sovereign right, that sovereign right emanates from two communities in the context of Cyprus. It does not belong to any one community. If we are going to have federation in Cyprus, sovereignty is shared. And we have to be able to behave responsibly on the subject of sovereignty. So it cannot be possessed by one of the communities. If it is, it's going to end up in division of the land. And there again, there's a responsibility on the leaders to shed light on the people, to give them guidance. Constitutional uh, framework, yes. Uh, <coughs> the general outline is that we are going to have certain federal competences and certain competences will be with the constituent states, which will be in defined area. The two constituent states will operate in a defined territory for both of them. And at the federal level, there it has not been an agreement yet, but the, the previous plans and the current plan that is being talked about, which is still under discussion, is that we have a rotation of the president on a basis of two to one, two terms for the Greek Cypriot, one term for the Turkish Cypriot president. And they will have uh, some kind of, both communities will be effectively sharing at the federal level in the, in the federal government. So it's, uh, as you have pointed out, there will be uh, both communities' representatives uh, effectively participating in the governance of the Federation. I don't know whether that answers your question, yeah, but there are lots of details to which we can... If I were to hand to... Yeah. I will first. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. So, what I was doing right now is I was looking for public opinion polls on my mobile phone, because I looked at the population sizes, which I wasn't quite sure I was surprised to find the population has been fairly stable throughout this entire period that we've been talking about today. So approximately 77% Greek and approximately 18% Turkish. And stability over this large period of time is surprising. I'm Ukrainian and I study Ukraine, which is very similar numbers. It's about 78-39% Ukrainians and about 16% Russians, right? And we also currently have a conflict. And the more and more I started reading public opinion polls, I was pleased to see that there seems to be a lot of agreement between these two groups. So the survey, this particular survey, is just telling us that overall, Greeks and uh, the Turkish population in Cyprus agree on many of the aspects of the settlement, except when it comes to two problematic things. The presence of foreign troops, which the majority of the Greek population has reported as being very anxious about, and the major large majorities were talking in the 70 percentile, 80 percentile, and the Turkish population would prefer to use foreign troops. Okay? And then the anxiety, uh, this was, I also found fascinating that about 89 percent of Greek Cypriots are anxious about if the settlement were to be struck in certain way that they're anxious that the other group would have entirely control over the situation in the country. 
I'm sorry. Control, political control of the situation in the country, whereas only 59% of Turkish Cypriots feel the same kind of level of anxiety. That to me is fascinating when they are 18 percent, when they represent 18 percent of the population. Perhaps you could explain that a little bit mm -hmm. more in the here. Okay. Um, thanks, Logan, for a very interesting um, talk. I, it's, it's amazing to me that we're we're here. I mean, I remember I started studying Cyprus over 20 years ago, and many of these issues were still being were being discussed then um, in, in quite similar ways, even though the, the environment has changed. But I mean, the interesting thing that you said that I'd like to hear more about is. You said the international community are, in a way, holding things back. Um, I'd like to know more about that, because back then, of course, everyone was expecting the international community, the UN, Secretary General, Representative, and so on, to, um, to make a real difference. And the, the EU wasn't even really on the agenda um, back then. Um, the other thing I'd be interested in um, hearing more from you about, though, is, is uh, the role of the intercommunal um, communities. You know, the, the, these little groups of people who've been running all these projects to sort of negotiate different things about identity and the, the Hong Kong cooperation and all those sorts of things. I mean, that seems to me to be um, a space of, I don't know, potential leadership in, in different professional and political and, and social zones where a, a lot of reconciliation has happened and those people involved have come to terms with the, you know, the, the kind of fallout. I wonder what you thought about that. Well, the impact of that is. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want me to move on? No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, yes, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rubin. Uh, that, that was a very, very interesting talk. Um, I want to touch upon a rather sensitive uh, issue of, of the Cyprus problem, and that, that is, uh, it's also quite controversial. Um, that, that is the, the, the future status of uh, those naturalized Turkish Cypriots um, of mainland Turkish background, um, or sometimes referred to as settlers, depending on, on the narrative. Now, we know that uh, the Annam Khan, back in 2004, uh, included <coughs> a, a number of detailed uh, provisions on this uh, for the first time uh, in the long history of negotiations. One of those provisions were, was that, uh, that these citizenships would be cut at 45,000, and the other one was that there would be uh, certain limits on immigration from both Greece and Turkey to Cyprus. And my question is, um, what is the current uh, Turkish Cypriot position on this? And whether the, the Turkish Cypriot uh, side still supports those provisions of the Now, first of all, uh, the percentages that you have mentioned uh, do not reflect today's numbers. It's 18% uh, to 78% is, uh, to my knowledge, uh, today it doesn't reflect the numbers. It's more in the range of 25 to 28% Turkish Cypriot uh, and, uh, and the remainder uh, Greek Cypriot. <coughs> Now, one issue that you raise on this is the presence of, of, of foreign troops on the island. The presence of uh, troops on the island that we see today is not permanent. Uh, the 1960 agreements foresee 650 Turkish troops and 950 Greek troops on the island as part of the Treaty of Alliance, Treaty of Guarantee and Treaty of Alliance that was agreed at that time, in addition to the British bases which, were, which are there on the basis of the Treaty of Establishment, which is another case. They, they are a sovereign base. If you're referring to the British bases in the foreign troops, that's another issue. The presence of Turkish troops and Greek troops on the island is another issue. The Annan plan of 2004 was so that all Turkish and Greek troops would leave the island in stages, agreed stages, and they would come down to 650 Turkish and 950 Greek troops as per the 1960 Treaties of Guarantee and Alliance. 
and that remains to be the case. So the number of troops that you see on the island are not a permanent arrangement. And it is already agreed that this is going to be the case. Now there is one difference. The difference is that the Turkish Cypriots, um, based on the experience of 1963, when the Greek Cypriots threw the Turkish Cypriots <coughs> They, they want an external guarantee that will deter the repetition of 1963, and that is the Treaty of Guarantee. The Treaty of Guarantee becomes operational the moment the state of affairs established on the island is violated. It doesn't become operational before that. And the state of affairs is, if it is changed, then the guarantors step in to reestablish the state of affairs that was agreed. Uh, I don't know whether this means I'm, I'm making myself clear on this to you. Um, so uh, the Turkish Cypriots want the continuation of the 1960 agreements of guarantee and alliance. The Greek Cypriots uh, are against it. This is one area where the two communities see differently. Uh, despite the limited numbers, 650 Turkish and 950 Greek troops on the island, they do have a difference between the Greek Cypriots and the Turkish Cypriots. Because of the numerical strength of the Greek Cypriots, Turkish Cypriots want an outside guarantee. So that is a, 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 a difference, but the numbers are 650 <coughs> and not today's numbers. What is today's numbers? Are there any credible figures of both Greek troops in the well, island? I mean, no country? figure has been announced. But there are people who talk about these numbers. The Turkish numbers are estimated to be, I mean, by, not by me, but that is in the press, between 25 to 30,000. And the Greek? Uh, uh, I have no idea about the Greek troops, to be, to be honest. Okay, so I think that's uh, that's what I can what, can, what I can say regarding your uh, question. Um, international community uh, holding back. Um, Let's talk first about the Security Council member countries. Security Council member countries have their own different, distinct national interests that are linked to Cyprus. Russia's interests vis-a-vis -vis Cyprus are different from the interests of Britain, from the United States, from France, and from China. Uh, Russia is more interested in keeping the status quo because they do have certain advantages in today's arrangements, which they're trying to build on because of their difficulties in Syria, as we have seen in the latest agreements between the government in the South and the Russians. So that is one, if you like, um, obstructive element in trying to change the status quo. The British may have different interests. They have a base. They may not want that base to be debated or taken up at future uh, discussions regarding Cyprus, so they may be interested in other things. I'm not going to, I, I'm in Britain now, so I don't want to be picked up. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's another uh, issue. But of course, the significance of the British bases over the last years has gone up. Therefore, I think Britain is more interested in those bases, not only the British, but also probably the Americans are also, probably NATO as well, may be interested in those bases, plus the listening facilities, the radar facilities on the island, more than before. So I think this is not significant. But they have offered to give up territory, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that is... the size of it. I mean, they, they are prepared to uh, do some uh, public relations exercises, if you like, if you like to put it that way, uh, in that regard, but it does not apply. Facilities that they, that they, they have. still like to use it. <laughs> uh, so uh, I think that's that's, uh, that's uh, the, the Americans have different interests in the region. Uh, so um, as long as um, um, they are sure that the change in the status quo is not going to undermine their interests, they may be interested in talking about it not before. Um, regarding civil society activity in, in, 
in Cyprus. I think it's doing uh, some positive uh, work in trying to bring together Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots uh, to cooperate in, in certain areas. But this has remained in uh, as an idealistic, if you like, exercise. <coughs> I would say that it has moved into practical terms. Uh, I mean, I've given you one example where we have been successful. That is the Cultural Heritage Technical Committee. We also have been successful on the Missing Persons Committees, also on demining, also on crime control. There is one, uh, one technical committee which exchanges information about people who have commi are committing crime and crossing to the other side for us to be able to uh, sort of uh, again catch those people and return them back to where they committed the crime. People are now working and cooperating uh, on those issues from the police forces of the two sides. So these are good developments, they are practical developments. Um, but I think there is lots of room, uh, more room if you like to cooperate in those areas. It's, it's increasing, the numbers are increasing, but it is, I think, uh, the, and we do need track two to be supportive of the work that is being done by track one, that's the official line. Uh, it's a complementary and supplementary process and needs to be strengthened. And we are, I mean, both Andreas and myself, and we, have, we are taking part in some of these activities ourselves, are supportive of those processes. Um, status of um, uh, naturalized uh, Turkish people. Now this is a human rights issue. Um, migration has been part of human, uh, human civilization since the very beginning. We move from place to place. Um, and. Uh, I remember when I used to live in Britain at one time, it was five years if you're a permanent resident of, of, of the UK, you would acquire British citizenship if you applied for one. And you had, if you had integrated into British society, you could become a British citizen. Uh, the current law in Northern Cyprus is 11 years. If you're a permanent resident, and if you have a permanent work permit, in Northern Cyprus for more than 11 years, you're entitled to apply for citizenship. Um, I think this is this is uh, this needs to be. Uh, I don't think we need to extend the period you know, beyond 11. I think 11 years is a reasonably enough time for people who have been integrated into a society. As I said, by uh, working in that society. Um, contributing to the economy of that society and uh, uh, seeing that it is his home has now become that country should be entitled for human rights reasons uh, to become a citizen of that country. So those people who have legitimately acquired citizenship uh, through uh, those legal mechanisms, both in the South and in the North, I think should be entitled to become citizens those countries and should be regarded as such. I do not think it's fair to ask people to go back if there is an agreement. Those people who have entitled, who are entitled to have fulfilled those conditions should be able to stay and become part of our society. In any case, the Turkish <coughs> as it stands today is dependent, has become dependent on those people who are uh, who, who have part of Turkish Cypriot society today. That's all I can say to you. But I, I, I'm very sort of uh, cautious about human rights issues in Cyprus. This is one of them. And we should, we should respect that. We have time for another uh, round of uh, uh, questions. Thank you. And first, thank you very much for the interesting uh, speech. Uh, my question will be about the uh, theory of rightness which you mentioned. According to the theory, if the conflict is not right to be resolved, if the conflict is not ready, if the mutual hurting stalemate does not exist, 
the conflict should not be left on its own, but confidence building measures should be applied. So I was wondering what is your uh, stance on this? What is your position about using Varosha, which we always think about the fenced area of Varosha and talk about confidence building measures to make an impact. What is your position on using Varosha as a confidence building measure? Of course, in return for some good water security yeah. stuff. As an archaeologist who's worked on Cyprus for more than 20 years, oh, excellent. Yeah, I have a very strong connection with the island. I have witnessed a lot of destruction of sites in the south, as well as hearing about a lot of destruction of sites in the north. And I do think that a shared and depoliticized cultural heritage is one of the key ways of moving forward. And I know there's some very good work going on in bicommunal activities between the departments and people in the north. But in times of financial crisis, this is basically cultural heritage is a theme that falls by the wayside. I would argue this is a human rights issue as well. And can resources be thrown at important issues like this? Can they be, sorry? Resources be thrown at issues like this as a way of helping integrate the community? I mean, money is basically what I'm saying. In this mm -hmm. time, is there a way of money being found for such important work? Mm -hmm. um, my question is just what effect do you think that Cypriot unification um, and stability would have Turkey's uh, candidate status for the European Union. Uh, can I have the question again, please? And um, what um, effect would Cypriot unification have on Turkey's okay. candidate status? For the Is there any other uh, question that uh, uh, one wants to? Zartman's rightness uh, theory. Yes, it's 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 a, it's a, a very valid. I mean, I, I am a, a strong supporter of the ideas of Professor William Zartman, and of course uh, the theory of rightness. How we can help, if you like, brighten the situation to make it more conducive for settlement is one of the key areas that he has tried to explore, uh, and he has pointed out to uh, confidentiality measures. But one of the tools that we can use to brighten the situation. Um, my idea on uh, confidence building is that um, when people talk about confidence building in Cyprus, the tendency has been towards um, one community building hopefully building confidence towards the other, but is not thinking in terms of the other community's needs for confidence building. So there is, as, as you have pointed out, Varosha that may, may be against the Turkish Cypriot interest as well. I mean, we can try to build uh, some kind of confidence in that direction. Uh, technically speaking, um, on the Varosha issue, Whatever return Turkish Cypriots could have against Varosha, and one aspect of it, one uh, return that has been talked about has been Erjan Airport. Uh, I don't know whether you had that in mind as well when you asked the question. You didn't mention it, but I can, I can mention that. On that issue, uh, on, that, uh, on that sort of give and take uh, balance, certain um, Sovereignty-related issues have come up. Uh, as to the status of Erdogan Airport, under whose authority and under whose sovereignty it is going to be opened up. And that became a political issue in the discussion. So, um, to the Turkish Cypriots, in return for Marosha, the opening up of Erdogan Airport would have, would, was seen to be an extension of the authority and of the sovereignty of the Republic of Cyprus over Erdogan as well, because it was going to be opened with the authority and under the, if you like, uh, permission uh, of, uh, uh, of the Greek Cypriot government of Cyprus. So there are certain problems attached to that. Uh, that has
has obstructed movement on that issue. Um, I think there's need to introduce confidence building between the two sides. I agree on that count. But there are many areas which I think will be less sensitive and will involve less of sovereignty uh, to be explored and to be applied. And I think that's what we have lacked so far. I think one of the areas on which we have been successful is the cultural heritage, as we have pointed out earlier on. On that issue, we have overcome, to some extent, some of the political sensitivities. Yeah. I can tell you that there is lots of pressure. That, that department is attached to my office. Mm -hmm. And I am currently having tremendous difficulty in sustaining uh, that work to continue. There is lots of pressure on us to politicize the work. And the, and the, and the person who is currently uh, sort of managing that department with, on the Turkish Cypriot side and on the Greek Cypriot side, Takis, these two people are enduring tremendous pressure from their communities. And we are, we are fully behind them trying to protect them from the pressure they are getting from different sections of Greek Cypriot society for Takis and for Ali, who's on our part, from the Turkish Cypriot society. I, we are today in the middle of a crisis on this issue. This is very common. I mean, I don't want this to, to be talked about. And we are trying to protect it. We, we are trying to avoid the difficulty from being politicized. It is important that this activity continue and should not be allowed to be politicized. There's a one reception afterwards. <laughs> so, um, I mean, it, it is sensitive, but other areas need to come in. One major area that I have been proposing here is hydrocarbons. If we can find the way to cooperate on hydrocarbons, it would be the biggest confidence building measure. It could transform into other areas, extend into other areas, and it would be the key to solve the Cyprus problem. Because it would have meant that we are really now realizing that to avoid things from getting out of control, we need to cooperate. So that's for that one. And there's, I think, one final. Money for cultural heritage. Um, yes. Um, I mean, the, the mega one. Uh, there are two main ones now. One of them is Apostolos Andreas, which is continuing. And the other one is, uh, the big one, is uh, the Otolo Tower that is now being done in Famagusta. Uh, we are trying to put in other places, uh, which hopefully will have an additional element of transformative use attached to the product to the area um, that is being restored so that uh, rather than keeping them artificially in place, we will have adaptive reuse for them so that the communities attached to it will also be able to maintain them. So that is one sort of uh, maybe area we are trying to explore, which will not require outside funds, but the funds will come from inside for, for the maintenance of those places. It's, a, it's an area, I think, which needs further talk for us. So, all, all I can say about that. What um, unification um, can have on the Turkish uh, EU, membership, uh, EU membership process, I think it will have a positive impact. Uh, and I think it is important, I mean, this is my own thinking, that we integrate Turkey in the inter-European Union and uh, make sure that Turkey as a critical country in this part of the world is uh, uh, internalizing European values um, of democracy, human rights, etc. Uh, more than it is doing now is essential. Uh, and as such, I think we have to move forward there's a responsibility on, on, on the European Union, on European countries, 
and of Turkey itself to engage in engage more actively uh, on the on the EU membership process. I know this is a difficult time for the European Union as well. The European Union itself is in difficulty at this particular time. We don't know whether the U the UK is going to be in the European Union next year. Uh, there are, there are discussions, uh, but uh, I think for Turkey uh, it is important. For us in Cyprus, also it's important that Turkey is part of the European Union and operates on the basis of those values. So I think it would help. Yeah. But just uh, before we uh, we, we discuss uh, a final and a slightly personal uh, question, I mean, I assume that uh, you would have lived through the. Um, the 1963 events as a, uh, a young child. You've witnessed the, uh, um, the attempted coup in uh, the 70s, uh, the Turkish invasion, the declaration of the independence in the north in 1983, the Annan plan, the revitalized uh, um, um, uh, peace process right now, and many other big events in between, I'm sure. Looking back, you feel more less or more or less the same attachment to your Cypriot identity? Well, I am a graduate of the Indian school, uh, which is a mixed school in Stravolos. Uh, um, so I have uh, worked with Greek Cypriots, I have had friends with Greek, have having friends with Greek Cypriots. Um, I have gone through 1963, uh, 1974, again for a different narrative purposes, I can say that it's not an invasion in the north, it's an intervention, uh, different interpretations <laughs> uh, come in. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, I lived in the States, I lived in the UK, I had a house in the UK, uh, but <coughs> I turned to separate.